but uh, again, it was NASA-funded research about uh, the, the life forms in in one of the lakes here in the western part of the U.S. that were, you know, uh, life was sustaining, uh, but operating on a different function, something on the order of, of uh, sustaining life within a hydrochloric acid type medium. I, I, I'm stretching. Can you do you have recollection there, sir? Uh, I, I don't remember the hydrochloric acid one, but uh, one of the problems that they have in airline fuel tanks is bacteria eating the liner of the fuel tank because they actually survive in the jet fuel. Ah, yes, interesting. Uh, the other uh, the other thing that's coming to mind for me here too, talking about because in essence, what this article is is really built around is attempting to disclose, to, to describe how it is that life is sustainable under conditions that we had previously felt we could not sustain life. Some of those conditions, uh, for those of us that uh, unfortunately, you know, are quite dated at this point in time, you know, we grew up uh, a long time ago, uh, the information we heard then was one of the most essential prerequisites for life is, is the presence of water. Uh, as well as some of the things they've touched upon here, uh, uh, the availability of oxygen, etc. This article is built around letting us understand that from an astrobiological standpoint, our earlier conceptions about the requisites for life are, <laughs> they were limited, to say the least. And I'd like to continue quoting from this article uh, under the section, uh, A Wet Road Planet. If Titan was a rogue planet with no star to call home, the researchers wondered if it could still be covered in seas due to geothermal heat. The researchers calculate Titan would need to release about 20 times more geothermal heat than Earth in order to keep its current surface temperature, which would be unrealistic for a world of its size. But, and that's capital B-U-T. However, if its atmosphere were 20 times thicker than current levels, it could retain enough heat to still have surface oceans. In other words, it is not necessary that this hypothetical sized planet would have to produce 20 times as much heat. That's not necessary at all. The essential component, the essential consideration is its atmosphere. In this article, they refer to it as the thickness of its atmosphere. That's a limited perspective. It actually is, is more correct to say the layers of its atmosphere and the composition of said layers of its atmosphere, and in particular, the blend of gases present and at what pressurization those gases are present within each layer. Um, Dr. Agnew, I always hate to hear my voice when it's going on for minutes after minutes. Your thoughts uh, here so far? Well, it, there's a, a, a foundation uh, equation called PV is equal to NRT pressure times volume is equal to the the number of moles times the gas constant times absolute pressure and so what you're talking about here is a relationship between pressure and temperature that allows uh, a particular compound to remain liquid and the compound we're talking about is water so this is the one assumption we've always had oh gee there's a sweet spot around every sun and you have to have a certain distance from the sun in order for water to be liquid on the surface too far away and we'd be a solid block of ice too close and we'd be just a big boiling uh, you know mass of steam which is true when you're relying on the sun for your energy but if there's enough energy inside the planet this geothermal energy this this core energy uh, and you have enough gravity, you have enough density to whatever is on your planet, now you have a condition under which uh, water can remain liquid under a, a variety of conditions. So if you obey the parameters of that equation, PV is equal to NRT, you can keep that particular compound, that N, that mole count, you can keep it at the temperature where it stays liquid and thus can support life. Quite right. And in fact, what I find interesting is that this sequence of disclosures and folks, everything that we're citing and quoting from our NASA.gov or space.com uh, releases, uh, we actually uh, get a little farther down the rabbit hole here and NASA now just discloses to us that even water itself isn't a necessary prerequisite. Uh, 
That begins the discussion of hydrocarbons. And then also just kind of retracing a few steps here, uh, the idea that uh, such aliens could consume organic compounds as Earth life does, but instead of inhaling oxygen, they would inhale hydrogen gas. Instead of ex uh, ex exhaling carbon dioxide, they would exhale methane. Um, some interesting stuff, but I want to keep uh, pacing ourselves so, so that we can cover a lot more real estate yet in the hour. Um, McKay, the astrobiologist, uh, or the researcher that we quoted here a bit earlier from uh, the same paper, this one again is uh, dated April 19 from space.com. McKay goes on to say, it is not clear how much atmosphere a rogue planet would have. In order for a starless planet to have liquid methane seas on its surface, a more realistic scenario might be for people larger and warmer than Titan have a thicker atmosphere. But what is essential to understand here, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about planets that are not orbiting a sun. Free-floating planets that are generating enough heat internally to perhaps sustain liquid water and also to perhaps have been uh, able to foster evolutionary processes of life without the necessity of orbiting a sun. They do this because of the internal mechanics of the planet, the heat that's generated internally, and in particular, the absolutely essential ingredient is the atmosphere. The gases that can uh, constitute each layer of the atmosphere, the, how they are pressurized, is what makes all the difference in the world. And, uh, you know, for a moment, I'd like to turn that specific topic to our own Earth to help us understand, walk our way through that set of uh, consequences. Dr. Agnew, could you help our listening audience understand a little bit more about Earth's own atmosphere, the layers, and et cetera? Well, uh, yeah, Earth's atmosphere is a, is a tenuous uh, layer of gas, uh, mostly nitrogen, that surrounds uh, our planet. Of course, it has the gases in it. It has CO2, and it has neon and argon and oxygen. And uh, uh, upon which we rely on the oxygen for our respiration, most of the other gases are inert. That is to say, they don't react very easily. But the combination of this atmosphere and our magnetosphere allows us to live on the surface of our world. Regardless of the solar radiation that's out there, you can pretty much go outside any day you want uh, without a shirt uh, for a reasonable amount of time. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, you can survive. You're not going to be sterilized. Mars, on the other hand, although it's a lot smaller than Earth, it doesn't have the atmosphere like Earth, and it doesn't have a magnet magnetosphere like Earth. And so you can't survive on the surface of Mars without some kind of additional shielding. The high-velocity particles uh, emitted by the sun, the radiation uh, emitted by the sun is so short, short wave, that uh, it would it would dimmerize, that is, say, break apart uh, human DNA, and you, you wouldn't last very long on the surface, and that's why there isn't anything alive on the surface of Mars. Does that mean there isn't anything alive underneath the surface of Mars? Absolutely not. A, a one meter underneath Martian soil, it could be perfectly livable. Uh, but that's why atmospheres are so important. And that has, if I can interrupt just a moment, as a matter of fact, I have a June 3 article that talks about a critter that might very well be able to live, just as you've mentioned, just below the surface of Mars. Uh, the title is, uh, the article is Discovery of Deepest Worms Holds Promise for Mars Life. And uh, we'll use that as a teaser. I I'd like you to continue your thoughts. Well, I, you know, we make an assumption that, that we're alone in the universe, and I think that assumption is held by less and less people every single year. And, and it's maybe helped along a little bit by sci-fi movies, but I think also intelligent people are getting to the point where they realize if there's a void out there with anything consumable, uh, organic or otherwise, there's probably life there. The good news is that if life does exist on Titan, you don't have to worry about it invading Earth anytime soon because we don't have an atmosphere of methane, and so they wouldn't be able to survive here. That sounds a lot like the War of the Worlds, in a way. <laughs> I, I jest. I jest. I jest. <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit like uh, Battlefield Earth, if you remember that uh, movie uh, oh, yes. based on the, the Robert Heinlein uh, story uh, where... Uh, <clears throat> The, uh, 
I think it's actually the, 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 L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron L. Hubbard. Well, L. Ron, L. Ron Hubbard is the one that popularized the movie, but, but uh, Robert Heinlein is the one that actually wrote the story. Ah. Uh, so Good. That, 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 was the, that was the interesting thing. That, sure, uh, sure. That, that we had aliens out there who were, who were needed gold to fix their, their atmosphere and that they survived on methane, which obviously would choke us to death. And so they had to build special biospheres in order to survive on our planet, but they were so militarily advanced that they could easily take over our planet and, uh, and, and make do of it. Now, the interesting thing is, and, and I think where we want to go with all this, is that, that we do have these few floating planets out there. Now we have you know, NASA releasing articles very innocuously out there uh, to sort of prepare those that are willing to dig deep enough, like Antonin, to find them. But then, uh, you know, if this is true, then wouldn't we see an indication of governments spending money to try to prepare for uh, the inevitable rendezvous between one of these free-floating planets and Earth? Mm, mm. It, it, that would seem to be logical, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier a little over $2 trillion missing in the Pentagon budget, and there are other agencies beside the, the Pentagon that have large amounts of missing money. And CIA, then we have, NSA? Sorry. And, sorry we have, and we have other countries. We have Russia, we got Switzerland, we got uh, other, and China, all spending money, and not a little bit of money, but but money on thousands upon thousands of underground shelters, first, of course, for their government leadership, but also for the people. And now Switzerland has enough underground shelters for everybody living in Switzerland. Russia is about uh, 40% of the big cities have enough shelters left over from, from post-World War II and Cold War era. But they're, they're digging them as fast as they can dig them. And my question is, Antonin, why? Why are we spending money on those? Why indeed? Why indeed? And uh, do you have some additional thoughts there on, on this thread, Dr. Agnew, or, or should we maybe try to return to that a, a little bit later? Well, you know, I, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, but I can tell you right now that uniformed war is a relic. You know, we the United States hasn't faced an enemy in uniform in well over 10 years, and we may never face another enemy in uniform. Now, we have some police actions here and around, you know, different places, and yet we're spending $1.3 trillion a year on national defense. Yes. Against, against whom? Right, right, you know? quite right. Yep. Nobody is going to land on the shores of Florida wearing rubber gum boots with death rays, <laughs> you know, to take over the United States. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> we'll, we'll see them the instant they board their buses to go to the airport to get to the ship to get here. It's <laughs> never going to happen. Yeah. So what are we doing? What are we gearing up for? There's it, no. It is. It is interesting to contemplate that our own defense budget, as you uh, have mentioned is greater than the sum total of every other nation state and their defense spending. So you're right on track. Why? Where? How? Why? What I, what I don't get is, you know, war isn't about ideologies anymore. It's not about water or land or border rights or religion or anything. It's about money. It, it's, it's just about trading weapons and cash and and natural resources back and forth. It's all it's all done by by big corporate structures. That's all war is anymore. So, but that's a small amount. That's a little tiny amount of the budget. What in the? I mean, and those budgets. Why in the world would they be building these big mega tunnels and these big huge bases? You know, thousands of feet under the ground. That doesn't make any sense. That that that's not the kind of you know expenditure that these huge global corporations want to spend on one another. There's no end in that. There's no, there's no return on the investment.